Robert George McCormick, professor of jurisprudence and director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University, joins me now on Skype. Robbie, welcome back. Always so good to have you on. Uh, tell me, what are your thoughts on what we as a nation saw and experienced last week? This is a difficult period for us as a people. Uh, we're facing some very serious challenges. And there are some questions that need to be answered about what happened uh, on January 6th. Uh, but I believe we can come through this a renewed and refreshed people. And I think the way we do that is by remembering our first principles, going back to the foundational principles of the American Republic, the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States, rooted as they are in the broader biblical tradition uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition, the tradition that begins in the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible with the proposition that human beings are made in the very image and likeness of God and therefore are precious. And that's why human life is precious. That's why justice is important. That's why respect for others is important. And we need to remember those ideals at this time as we think back on what happened on January 6th and on the context of what happened uh, and go forward resolving that we're going to do better. Absolutely. Um, I know you posted something on your Twitter uh, about naming and honoring people who disagree with you on matters that are important to you. Uh, as we heard Owen mention in his report, President Trump has been banned from Twitter and others are claiming that those with conservative voices are being silenced on social media. What's your take on that? Well, I'm worried about that kind of tech censorship. Uh, the tech platforms have enormous power. They do provide the means of communication now for millions upon millions of uh, people. This is how we interact with each other. It's the equivalent of the public square uh, in the old days or even the village green uh, in the old days. And it's important for all voices uh, to be heard. So I'm concerned about it. I'm also concerned about the oligarchic aspect of it, that you have a few very powerful people uh, who are making decisions that affect everybody else. Now, there are limitations on speech. There are uh, sorts of speech, forms of speech that are not legally protected, not protected by the First uh, Amendment. Uh, incitement to violence is one of them. Intimidation is one of them. Obscenity is one of them. False advertising, conspiracy. So not all speech is protected. But political speech is protected. And it's protected for those we disagree with as much as we those we agree with. And I don't think it's a good answer simply to say that, well, these uh, platforms, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and so forth, are private companies, and therefore uh, we have no legitimate concern uh, as the public in uh, how they conduct their affairs or who they exclude or who they include or what sorts of uh, restraints they put on speech. No, that's not realistic. Uh, these companies play a very important role in the public. They benefit very much from uh, public resources, and so they're going to have to be uh, accountable. I do think we need to demand that basic principles of free speech be respected on the big platforms. And Robbie, before I let you go, um, can you maybe just give some advice or share some thoughts on how we can move forward in healing, especially for Catholics? Well, yes. Uh, first, I think that uh, it's important that President Trump take responsibility and be held accountable for uh, actions that I believe were reckless. Uh, he crossed the line when he led the public to believe or his supporters to believe, including the crowd that he called to come to Washington to believe that Vice President Pence had it within his power uh, to decide which slate of electors uh, to recognize coming out of the uh, states. Uh, where he was contesting the vote. Uh, as Vice President Pence himself recognized, he had no such authority. It would have been a gross act of constitutional uh, uh, violence against the Constitution, really, uh, for the vice president uh, to have exercised the power that the president was demanding that he exercise. And then the president claimed that uh, the vice president's refusal to perform an unconstitutional act constituted a kind of betrayal. Uh, that helped to whip the crowd up into a frenzy. Now, not everybody in the crowd, only a minority of people, uh, then assaulted the uh, Capitol building and produced that outrageous and appalling scene that we witnessed on January 6th. 
uh, but some people did. And I think the president has to take responsibility for that and be accountable for that. Uh, we can debate exactly how that accountability uh, ought to be uh, handled. Uh, but I don't think we can pretend that the president doesn't have responsibility here. Now, at the same time, we have to understand that there's a background to all of this, and we don't uh, want to tolerate any hypocrisy here. Uh, there has been violence in our streets. There has been lawlessness. There's been arson assaults on a, uh, on a federal building in Portland, Oregon, a courthouse. Uh, and some folks who are critical of the president said nothing uh, or even did worse than say nothing uh, when that violence uh, happened. So let's end the hypocrisy. Let's tell the truth on both sides. Let's hold accountable everybody who has participated through the summer and into January 6th and on January 6th in producing the appalling result that we saw. Well, well said, and we're going to leave it right there. Thank you so much, Robbie. We always appreciate your perspective. Thank you, Tracy. My pleasure.